Hi, I'm Mark Lawson, president of ECS Music Publishing Group, home of E.C. Shermer. We're very pleased today to have a chance to talk with composer Craig Bohmler about a couple of his new vocal solo pieces that we have just published. Welcome, Craig, to our program. Thanks, Mark. Uh, tell us a bit about your background and how you got started in composition. I started writing, uh, or at least tinkling around with music um, as a composer at 16 years old. I had been uh, taking piano lessons since I was six. But at 16, I um, started, you know, seeing if I could create my own kind of works, obviously for the piano and obviously terribly derivative of, you know, everything that you heard, particularly the 19th century. <laughs> uh, yes. And so, uh, but also during that time, I uh, began to go to the, the opera theater. Uh, my parents were always good at um, at taking me to the musical theater. So I had always been enticed by that. But we used to drive to Casa Manana in Fort Worth, which, uh, and I got to see Debbie Reynolds and Harv Presnell and Richard Harris and Julie Andrews. And, you know, they, they brought in the, the, the big people there. When I was 17, I saw Of Mice and Men uh, by Carlisle Floyd. Mm -hmm. And that remains, I would say, in my top five theatrical experiences ever. I in that moment said, I want to do that, what, whatever right for the stage was at that time. I had no vocabulary for it. Long story short, I got to study with Carlisle and I actually, he was my mentor for about eight years. He moved to University of Houston. I was from Houston. I got to be one of his students and I started the um, down in, in, in that world. Also, I was a, uh, trained uh, also through him, through uh, the Houston Opera Studio as a vocal coach. So I got mm -hmm. to be in the room with I know the, the, that was the last days of the, of the great opera singers. Uh, I got to be in the room with Pavarotti, with Domingo, with Franey, with Eva Marton, with John Vickers. And I got to watch and see how voices worked and how vocal music really lay inside the instrument. As a result, um, most everything I write is for the stage mm -hmm. or for some kind of text setting mm -hmm. of some sort. Mm -hmm. I have written a number of concerti uh, or sonatas for solo instruments, but really I would say 95% of my output is with, uh, is with word. Yeah, you can see that in your, in your writing that you really care a lot about the voice. So we have two new publications and I thought we could just talk about those sure. for a little bit. The first is one called Love Letters. Uh, very, very interesting piece. Uh, tell us about where you found this text and how you came to this. After many years, I decided I only wanted to write original texts. And I have, I have seven c collaborators, if you will, some poets, some librettists, some for comedies, some for drama, uh, you know, depending on, on, on what is needed. And, and these are long-term marriages that I have been in for a while. I also like to write for specific singers whose work I admire. And so in this particular case, uh, my dear, dear friend, Lena Shinakis, for which I have written, I guess, three different pieces, the mezzo-soprano, who is fearless, dramatic, passionate, uh, and amazing. We were, we were doing, I believe, a competition, the Carmel competition, which she won. Uh, and I said, it, it would be fun to write you something for that. And, and I, I like them to pick their own uh, texts if, it's, mm -hmm. you know, if, if they can, or commission a uh, one of my poets to do a text for them or to say what a subject might be. And her husband had written these 26 poems. Now, he is, he is an environmental engineer, so, but he's also a very romantic man and Lebanese, and uh, they were very much in love. And he wrote, he was going away for 26 days. So he wrote 26 love poems. And um, then the last one, which was written after he returned, which is the proposal. Uh, spells out will you marry me in the margins and uh, <laughs> and and uh, and she did of course but anyway she said what if um what if you set some of my husband's poems so i read all 26 of them and picked out including the last one uh five more to to go with the set they're beautiful they're beautiful poems and then you did a beautiful job with setting them i think they're thank you, they're thank you. really beautiful so that's a great story so the other piece is uh, just incredibly unusual in many ways. And um, the English text of this is something like, let's see, four little songs for breakfast. But of course you did it in French. So 
talk about <laughs> your idea on this and uh, uh, some of the uniqueness of this publication. I think it's great. Well, back in the 80s, I, I went to the Banff Center as an artist in residence, and then I became musical director there for the winter program for uh, three, of the, three of those years, and uh, for three more years. In Canada, what's cool is that every single product has its you know, equivalent in English and its equivalent in French. So you can study the back of the toothpaste tube if you want to. You can study uh, you know, the shaving cream if you, if you wish. In this particular case, it was the Post Golden Raisin brand. And one morning, and particularly tired uh, morning, if I recall, I was doing that, I was studying my, I was looking at the English, do you know why Post put so many plump, juicy raisins in Post Golden Raisin brand? It's so you get some in every spoonful. And I was reading the French and I was reading it out loud because you know I was trying to get the pronunciation. And I went, this is rhythmic and, and it's kind of sexy and it kind of scans like a foray song. And so um, I recalled something that Ravel had, uh, had, had uh, said many years ago. Uh, and he said, you know, right, a composer's ability is, is, uh, is gauged by his uh, ability to what, what, it, what is needed. So I thought, well, you know, it might be interesting because, you know, as we all know, and I love movie music as well. So John Williams, you know, will write like Mahler or Ravel or Prokofiev for, you know, whatever needs to be done. And I thought it would be really interesting as a coach and as a composer to get inside the real nuance of what makes Debussy and Ravel and Boré and Poulenc different from one another. And it'll force me to kind of investigate. And I thought, well, there's four events on this box. Uh, the the coupon, the why it exists, the ingredients, and you know, of course, the saddest one of all, it's sold by weight, not by volume. So you know, when you look in, and there doesn't seem to be enough, and yet you know, be, be reassured. And so um, I went through you know these four composers to do this. They're they're, they're like etudes for me as a composer mm -hmm. uh, to to force me inside those styles really. And, uh, and then they're also just good fun. Well, they're just so much fun. And I, I sure hope that uh, singers, teachers will take a look at these because they're, they're just delightful. Well, before we quit, I just want to quickly touch on, we could do a whole program on this, but you, uh, you've also written a, an opera which we have published that is, had, was just done at Arizona Opera and it, for the second time and it's Writers of the Purple Sage, and it is coming into our catalog, and we're very excited about that. Uh, just give us a quick overview of that opera for those that are interested and uh, how they might explore that a little further. It is the first American Western, and it was written in Arizona by Zane Gray, um, and it really is, it may not, there was actually kind of a pre-Western that he wrote before that, but this is the one that set the headwaters for what is considered the American Western style. Everything after this responded to the style, rebelled against the style, but it became the centerpiece. It went into the public domain. So I started to write this uh, just for fun. And I called in my best friend, Stephen Mark Cohn, whose many works you published. Mm -hmm. And I said, you want to try your hand at a libretto? And he said, I don't like opera. And, um, and but anyway, he started and the characters started to speak to him. And so this is his first libretto and it's, I think, as good as any. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And, and it's a very character driven. Anyway, Arizona Opera got wind of it and it was their very first world premiere. Ah. And it was so successful for them. Um, they wanted to do it again three years later. So that's what just happened. Fortunately, just in before, time, week before the theaters closed, it, it, it had finished up, so right just in um, time. But anyway, it's a it's a western uh, with a stampede and an avalanche and a storm and all that stuff that westerns have. Um, and you don't actually see any horses, uh, but you've got a lot of horse interludes. I call them. Uh, they they act like the sea interludes in in Britain's Peter Grimes. Uh, they they take us from place to place and let us know where we are. It's great. Uh, but it was an opportunity for huge orchestral writing. Uh, very dramatic uh, landscapes um, uh, and very dramatic music, very current story about um, religious fundamentalism, mm -hmm. uh, w women's rights. Right. I was amazed at how when I, when I looked at the libretto and 
looked at it, how current it actually is for something that was written then. Well, I think if people want to see more about that, they can look at your website and they can look at our website as soon as we uh, kind of get everything up. But uh, right now, there are quite a, there's quite a bit of material on your website about it. Writersopera.com. So, Very good. Uh, yeah. Very good. Well, thank you for taking time to visit with us. And uh, you, we hope that you stay healthy. Thanks for sending us these wonderful pieces. Well, thank you very much. Take care. Take care.